everyone. Uh, I'm Peg Hogan from the University of Portland, and uh, I am not moderating this session. I'm just going to get it started. And there's no one who ever moderates Tris Engelhardt, so <laughs> not even Susan Engelhardt. So, but I, uh, which that's Tris's wife. Um, she tries. <laughs> Uh, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of introducing Tris, and as I went through all of his wonderful accomplishments, uh, we went through the whole hour, and he never got a chance to talk. So he's never forgiven me of that, uh, so I won't do that today. But uh, those of you who know him know that just the list of his accomplishments would easily fill all of the time that we have for this session. So. And, and those of you who don't know Tris, let me just tell you a few things about him. Uh, Tris, as you all should know, has adopted the state of Texas as his home state. Uh, and and those, those of you who didn't know, I certainly got clued on, on that very quickly. Uh, Tris holds an MD with honors from Tulane University School of Medicine. He also holds a PhD. It was not one of these chintzy MD-PhD things where you did one something related to medicine like physiology. No, Tris's PhD is an authentic PhD, that is, it's one in philosophy, the only true doctorate, right, PhD. <laughs> Tris has been a Fulbright Fellow, uh, he has been a Fellow in so many different uh, programs, a Fellow uh, for uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in West Berlin, a visiting scholar at the Liberty Fund, and he is a Fellow of the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. Currently, he is professor in the Department of Philosophy at Rice and professor emeritus in the Department of Medicine, as well as in the Department of Community Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. He has held appointments at Rice and Baylor since January of 1983, uh, after leaving Georgetown University, where he was the Rosemary Kennedy Professor of Philosophy of Medicine. <laughs> Dr. Engelhardt is, is a distinguished author and editor. He is editor of the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, senior editor of Christian Bioethics, and editor of Philosophy and Medicine book series with over 25 volumes in print. He is 80. 80, okay. All right. I, I, just, I only updated this last week, so I can understand why it is now 80. Uh, he is also editor of the book series, Philosophical Studies in Contemporary Culture. He has authored, at least as, as soon as last week, only 285 articles and chapters, in addition to one, over 100 book reviews and other publications. There have been over 135 reprintings or translations and translations of his publications. One has even been translated into Texas, Texans, so I'm told. He has also co-edited more than 25 volumes and has lectured widely throughout the world. His, his books include Bioethics and Secular Humanism, The Search for a Common Morality, and the second thoroughly revised edition of the Foundation of Bioethics, which has now been thoroughly um, revised as the Foundation of Christian bioethics. Uh, Trist has also been called to civil service. He's been known to serve, I think, as deputy sheriff now and then in Texas. I give you Dr. Trist Engelhardt. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Peg Hogan for the very generous introduction and to thank all of you and Notre Dame for the privilege and honor to speak to you today. I need, uh, before I begin, to give you informed consent, because what you will hear is a highly politically incorrect and outrageous <coughs> sermon. Uh, should you not feel that this is what you wanted to stay for for about an hour, I'd be not all upset if you walk for the door. Uh, I don't want people to uh, be unduly traumatized. What I'm going to do is to reflect together with you on the necessary conditions for the possibility of renewing our culture. Now, to talk about renewing our culture, one has to have some idea of what the new should look like when you've renewed it. And you will see that I will make this my claims in terms of how one renews culture by anchoring it in a theological way of life. That's politically insensitive enough. That is, I'm going to argue that culture will never be rightly directed unless one knows about the meaning of the universe, the meaning of man, uh, that is, to realize that it is essentially tied to our union with God, and I will give an account of this in terms of what I take to be the views of traditional Christianity.
So uh, I'm going to argue about how to renew our culture, and that to renew our culture we have to embed all that we have in theological knowledge, and then I'm going to make the claim that theological knowledge just doesn't give us a context in terms of which we understand other things, and that the theological knowledge does not simply give us a truth, the truth, in terms of which we understand things as Christians that other people don't know, but theology is most uh, essentially, in its core, union with truth. And here you will notice that I have an epistemology that may deviate from almost everyone save about three or four people in the audience because I will have in my background uh, a view of the human condition which will not be Augustinian. Thank God I have been preserved against that. Uh, I will not, I hope, not be tempted. Uh, that those who want to sit, you sit in the front here, I only occasionally spit when I get excited. Uh, that, that you'll note in the back of my presentation a background set of assumptions about the impact of the ancestral sin upon us, which I take has to be understood to realize what it is to renew humans. To afford to renew humans is to renew fallen humans. And the uh, view of the impact of the ancestral sin uh, is uh, surely like uh, Augustine in the sense that uh, it has an impact on the will. Anybody who's been to Texas understands that. Uh, Baba every now and then just has to shoot that jukebox. Uh, and it's a kind of a crazier, and you know it's going to happen. Uh, at a second order level, of course, he has to be uh, repentant about doing that. I mean, just because you're genetically determined to do certain acts doesn't mean you're not guilty for those acts as involuntary sins. And you must at the second level say, Oh, I know I can't control myself. I'm going to go down to the honky-tonk again tonight, and I know if they play that song, I'm going to whoop up my 357, blow away that new jukebox. But on the second order, you have to say, that's bad. It's really bad. Bad bubba. Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're genetically determined to think you have to have the second. And so part of what the fall is, is our uh, endowments and inclinations are wrongly ordered. And a brief uh, uh, acquaintanceship with Texas politics will convince you of that. The second is that uh, humans are marked by passion. Uh, we are not uh, people who live uh, in control of our energies, but our energies go to places we have no control over at times. In the introduction, uh, 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 Peg was kind enough not to point out that besides all the other things, I'm probably the only person you've ever seen, you can tell by my uh, physique, who has done push-ups with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, uh, after the ancestral say not only do we have weakness, we always got passions. But the most difficult, the hardest of all impacts upon us is that we no longer have our hearts open to God. Uh, St. John Chrysostom in his first homily on Matthew and his first homily on uh, uh, St. John's Gospel bemoans the fact that we need to use the scriptures because if our hearts were open we would walk with Abraham like a, uh, uh, we would be like Abraham and walk with God like a friend and like Moses. Uh, if you use the scripture, your heart is broken and you have not restored it. More than that, he understood that true philosophy is the philosophy done by monastics who finally succeed in opening their hearts. Uh, that is the real break in our epistemological context, uh, the break in us that our hearts don't open. For as it says in the sixth beatitude, the pure heart will see God. And here is the real political insensitivity of the presentation. It's going to say if you don't want to renew culture and renew uh, Roman Catholic or Protestant or anybody else's Christian education, you're going to have to focus on opening the heart. And the Christian answer of how to open the heart is one that goes against all the grains of Texian civilization. You have to be chaste to pursue chastity. Secondly, you have to live an ascetic life, and you have to engage in right worship. Well, only in the context of right worship do you finally know truly, not in a discursive fashion, uh, not uh, taking some revelation as having taken place 2,000 years ago. You come into the union of the Noah with the Noah. Now, that's going to be the presentation. We're going to run for the hills. And that's everything except the last page. The last page will even be more puzzling than the rest of it. So you may, well, I'll tell you when we get to the last page and so go, go off to sleep. Uh, it will uh, make references to a hymn that probably only three or four people have ever heard. It's a hymn uh, sung five, the five, first five Fridays uh, in Great Lent uh, in the Greek usage, not in the Slavic. Uh, about a miracle in the year 620 talking about the city. 
it brings the ambiguity of not Augustinian ambiguity. Remember, Augustine had his chain yanked when Alaric went through Rome in the year 410. He writes his account of the city of man, the city of God. It's an invocation for us to see ourselves, us broken people, broken Texans and Indianans, or how you refer to yourselves, who are Christians coming into union and symphony with the city of those who have opened their heart. So the city of man, the city of God are in this sort of symphony, ideally. Okay. Also, those who have looked at the fathers like St. John Chrysostom notice that they're not, thank God, like Thomas Aquinas. It's a homily. Why is it a homily? Because it's pointing to you out where to get knowledge. If you come to learn how to read x-rays, physicians don't give you a deductive account of how to read x-rays. They show you x-rays and show you how to open your mind and see. So if you look at the theology of traditional Christianity, it's empirical. It's how to open your heart and see. Okay, here we go. After all that preface, I'm finally going to read the paper. Don't try to leave after this. I do have a go. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Section 1, Civic Virtue as Fighting Words. Immanuel Kant observes that, and I quote, every political commonwealth may indeed wish to be possessed of, a, of sovereignty according to laws of virtue over the spirits of its citizens. For then when its methods of compulsion do not avail, for the human judge cannot penetrate into the depths of other man, their dispositions to virtue would bring about what was required in their behavior. Kant recognized that a well-ordered society is not simply governed by laws, but bound by a common pursuit of virtue. When moral understandings and civic virtue are in harmony, social conflicts are minimized. In addition, moral education can unanimously focus on a common vision of propriety, justice, and human flourishing. Further, there will be a common appreciation of the ideals that should govern families, associations of citizens, and communities, so as to support a shared version, vision of proper personal interaction and social justice. There will be a consensus about what is needed to renew the moral strength of such a society and correctly to inform its moral energies. We do not live in such a society, if in fact such ever existed. We are not united in one morality. We disagree about the nature of morality, appropriate social structures, and the goals of moral education. We even disagree regarding the character of moral education itself, as I will shortly illustrate by giving you an outrageous view of how I think such education should be conducted. The origins of these disagreements can be understood in various ways. Most particularly, they are rooted in conflicting understandings of what is involved in acquiring knowledge about the human condition. Disagreements about the character and con content of knowledge about the human conditions have wide-ranging implications for the development and renewal of culture and direction of education. At stake is what it means to know rightly and how such knowledge can be achieved. This presentation argues that just as education in the technologies requires an appreciation of the sciences, and just as an appreciation of the sciences <clears throat> requires education in the humanities, an appreciation of the technology, sciences, and humanities requires their placement within a theologically rightly directed life, such that all that one knows is used and appreciated correctly. This paper contends in favor of a theological orientation of culture, and therefore of cultural renewal and education. As should become clear as this presentation proceeds, theology here identifies not a scholarly enterprise, not some philosophical theology, but a way of life. This view is predicated on a non-Kantian understanding of knowledge. It recognizes that there is a noose but the human heart is open to truths that transcend the horizon of the finite and the imminent. At stake is a moral and metaphysical epistemological thesis that can be articulated in weak, intermediate, and strong varieties of account. 
come as no shock to you, I will support the strong one. The weak account is that unless one appreciates how values and cultural assumptions frame the development of all actual techniques, technologies, and sciences, one will fail completely to understand one's cultural context. In this account of education, the humanities provide a needed appreciation of the context within which one lives and acts. The humanities provide cultural orientation. The intermediate account holds that there is a truth of the matter with respect to how one should employ the techniques and technologies at one's disposal, and with respect to which how one should understand the deliverances of the sciences, so that knowing such framing truths about the character of human good and human flourishing uh, is essential to a full human life. In particular, it will be necessary to a virtuous life. So our strong thesis is that full knowledge of the human condition is achieved only through a way of life that restores noetic knowing. This theological understanding of the human condition regards humans as, through the fall, isolated within the horizon of the finite and the imminent. It identifies a radical rupture between humans and the deep meaning of being, as well as the direction and purpose of the cosmos. The world of the fall is well captured by the accounts of David Hume and Immanuel Kant. But you might notice, if you try natural law organs, amongst most people wandering around, they say, huh, I don't get it. If you already have a view that there's a God, you could, uh, as an earlier presentation made today, you can give expositions of it. But like Clement of Alexandria pointed out, uh, unless you know that you know the right pre pre premises and axioms, you never can deliver a sound rational argument. Okay? Which is to say that we live after the fall within the epistemic uh, context described adequately and rightly by David Hume and Immanuel Kant. What is lost within the horizon of one's sense impressions, what is isolated within the boundaries of possible spatial, temporal, sensible experience, what is disbarred from any legitimate knowledge claims about ultimate purposes, direction, and meaning. The, the strong epistemological thesis is that human knowledge is complete only when it locates the human condition within the knowledge of the ultimate meaning and goals of human and cosmic history, <clears throat> and that. This knowledge is gained in a way of life. The strong epistemological thesis is the polar opposite of a nihilism that finds humans isolated within numerous alternative accounts and narratives of the human condition, among which there is no principal choice to be made. Even in terms of the weak moral and metaphysical thesis, a significant case can be disclosed for the importance of philosophical and theological orientation and cultural development renewal in university education. The weak thesis allows one to recognize that if one masters techniques without understanding the meaning or locus of those techniques, one fails to achieve a full, competent technological command of how to use the skills, practices, and procedures, especially in new circumstances, because you don't know the locus of it, you can't extend Full appreciation of the meaning or the logos of those techniques is usually first sought in the sciences. Further, it's recognized that because the techniques one masters, the technologies one develops, and the knowledge one acquires of the physical world bear on social structures, human relations, and human values, one in addition needs the encompassing perspective of the humanities, the study and appreciation of that which is most truly human. The intermediate thesis involves advancing a particular philosophical and theological perspective as the guiding framework for the appreciation of the technologies, sciences, and other humanities. These two understandings in various ways mark the first, second, and third or new hum humanisms in which Western culture sought to relocate its energies in terms of the values that direct and nurture human flourishing. There's, there have been major cultural renewals uh, engaged in the West. The first humanism is the one that happens after the city falls in 1453. A lot of professors lose tenure in Constantinople and go west with their books. And there's a blooming of the Renaissance already underway. And there's a sense in the West that you're recapturing that which will locate us most fully uh, by understanding what these uh, scholars have brought. The second humanism is that of Niethammer with the uh, 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 creation of humanistic gymnasia 
uh, at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. And then there's a third humanism, also called the New Humanism, that starts at the end of the 19th century, goes into the 20th century, a hope to locate technology and science. Most contemporary mainline Christian attempts at renewal and education are framed in these terms, with the addition for a place for theology as a scholarly endeavor. The strong thesis holds that education in its fullness cannot be appreciated without induction into that life that makes noetic knowledge possible, thus enabling a well-directed development of culture and education. The strong thesis holds that this induction into a rightly ordered Christian life is not simply helpful for moral appreciation of the values that frame human interactions, but in addition, it leads to the cardinal human knowledge and noetic knowledge of which Christ spoke when in the sixth beatitude he said, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. The paper will then first lay out the starkness of the contrast between traditional Christian culture and the emerging post-traditional post-Christian uh, post culture. This will allow you to understand how really politically incorrect traditional Christianity is. So if you're a traditional Christian, you'll realize why most people will really hate you. Uh, if you are a post-traditional Christian, you'll hate traditional Christians now with further information for them. <laughs> In doing so, the paper present, employs a special sense of traditional Christianity, which requires acknowledgement at this point. Traditional Christianity will be used to identify the Christianity of the first seven councils of the church, in which nearly all Christianities have their roots. Not all, and historians and others, but it is that which unites us. It is the root. The moral, metaphysical, and epistemological and theological commitments of this, of this Christianity are in various extents still endorsed by conservative Roman Catholics and some conservative Protestants. They are at the living core of Orthodox Christianity, having laid out some of the geography of the conflicts between traditional Christian culture and the now dominant post-traditional, post-Christian culture. The presentation sketches some of the implications of traditional Christianity and its strong moral and epistemological uh, thesis for education and the pursuit of virtue. Traditional Christianity recognizes that the acquisition of a pure heart through which one comes to see the ultimate framing reality that defines the human condition occurs liturgically, that is living a rightly ordered life of worship. After all, humans are beings primarily created to worship God, to know truly and fully only when they worship rightly. That's the kind of beings we are. Because the fullness of human worship is achieved Eucharistically, in the liturgy, this moral and epistemological standpoint defines the character of a rightly ordered and rightly directed life. That is, you won't be able to get into the epistemic standpoint to see truly unless you can enter into the liturgical act which expresses what we were created to do, and you only participate in that when you participate worthily in the Eucharist, which means if you want to know truly, if you want to renew yourself and your culture, got to figure out how to enter into that Eucharistic standpoint worldly, because only there can you lead to intimate knowledge of the defining reality of the human condition. Uh, in terms of this cardinal liturgical grounding, one can preach that it is only through a life of chastity and asceticism that one can enter into this privileged moral epistemological epist uh, and metaphysical standpoint, chastity and asceticism are cardinal conditions for the renewal of culture and the pursuit of a Christian education. One learns not merely how to think and behave through a life of chastity and asceticism directed to and placed within right worship. Most significantly, only within this life will one learn how to know fully. No doubt. That will uh, seem to many of you, and probably already does, really exotic. The contention is that Christian renewal and education must first and foremost be located in a traditional Christian life world and way of life. Now, it's probably very good at this juncture to acknowledge that I speak as a sinful Texan. As I turn to consider well, the cardinal importance of traditional Christianity and the ascetic pursuit of right worship. worship. Much of my appreciation of these matters has come late in life. 
uh, in developing this account, I feel somewhat like my erstwhile fellow graduate student, uh, William Bennett. You've heard about Mill, who in giving lectures about virtue must face reports about his own gambling. Uh, I feel like him. It is as a sinner that I speak about virtue. Mea maxima culpa est. You made it through now the formal introduction. Now we're section two. Uh, the only for the uh, only another eleven pages. So you, I think you'll make it. Christianity's traditional commitments, openly and publicly acknowledged, are at the very best outrageous. They involve a rich set of responsibilities and virtues incompatible with the dominant electoral culture of North America and Western Europe. This discordance is expressed in all of the ordinary concerns of life. For instance, traditional Christians place all sexual exp expression within the marriage of a man and a woman. There are also conflicting understandings of individual and familial reproductive responsibility in discordance with the dominant culture. Traditional responsible parenting recognizes the obligation never to act against innocent life and surely always to protect the life of unborn. A few people asked me why my wife wasn't here and I said my wife had run off to be with a person of undetermined gender. Now, if you're a traditional Christian, you'll figure that out. Uh, my number two daughter's expecting her third child. Uh, since uh, uh, there was no need to do a sonogram up in Alaska that she wanted to kill the kid, uh, she doesn't know whether it's male or female. So my wife went up to Homer, Alaska to be with a person of undetermined gender. Okay. This ethos of responsible reproduction is at odds with that grounded in a taken for granted expectation of prenatal diagnosis and selective abortion, which claims a responsibility not to burn society with undue costs and affirms a goal of producing one or at most two perfect trophy children. Because the icon of the best of deaths is that of Christ on the cross, suffering is appreciated in traditional Christian understanding in terms of an offered opportunity for crucified love. Moreover, there's a strong appreciation of the wrongly directed character of intentionally hasting death through physician-assisted suicide, passive euthanasia, or active euthanasia. This traditional Christian ethos has important implications for how one should approach issues in medicine and understand obligations in the public sphere. Worse yet, the family and the relationship of the sexes in traditional Christianity is in deep discord with the framing culture. This dominant culture, I take to be nested within the social democratic assumptions one finds reflected in the commitments of persons such as John Rawls and Habermas. These background moral and political commitments give a central priority liberty, to liberty and a limit, or uh, 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 a, a, a central uh, uh, priority to liberty, and liberty is celebrated as a form not of uh, as, as liberty is celebrated as a form of self-determination that presupposes individuals as determining their life choices and their vision of the good, unconstrained by the commitments and authorities of traditional communities. For example, the view is that it is integral to human flourishing and that individuals determine for themselves their own vision of the good life and human flourishing, the accent falls as much on the role of the individual as on the content of the vision of the good that is affirmed. At stake is not simply a requirement that one have good grounds for the position one affirms, but that one do so outside of the heteronymous influences of traditional communities so as to be able freely as an individual to firm, affirm one's way of life. That's not how anyone raises their children obviously. You hope to give them good reasons and hope that they will not be sidetracked by what might appear to be falsely uh, attractive reasons. Uh, in particular, out of considerations of the virtue of liberty, one should not affirm a way of life that requires one humbly to submit one's will to God. Priority is given as well to concerns with equality. It is not just that persons are to be recognized as equal in the sense of being equal in authority over themselves. In addition, it becomes centrally important that compensatory interventions be undertaken to, ensure, to assure equal opportunity in pursuit of primary social goods. When carried through in a consistent and thoroughgoing fashion, 
somewhat like Amy Gutman, uh, this approach to equality is, as uh, James Fishkin and others have noted, at its roots in conflict with such inegalitarian structures as the family. For families seek to provide advantages for their own members in ways that undermine the pursuit of equality of opportunity. In addition, worse yet, families are often framed by uh, authority structures hostile to a range of commitments to the values and claims of equality of opportunity and liberty. As an illustration, one might consider John Rawls' concurrence in Mill's criticism of the family as a school ground for the suppression of women. I quote from Rawls. Mill held that the family in his day was a school for male despotism. It inculcated habits of thought and ways of feeling and conduct incompatible with democracy. If so, this is continuing roles. If so, the principles of justice in joining a reasonable constitutional democratic society can plainly be invoked to reform the family. Close quote from Rawls. One need not defend the view of the family in which the husband and father is despotic to recognize John Rawls would be far from sympathetic with social institutions that have instructed men and women to be equals in a hierarchy, such that men possess the headship in the family, the teaching authority in the church, and the sole entree to the mysterious priesthood. The traditional Christian view of equals in order or hierarchy of authority goes deeply against the grain of the social democratic vision that rejects status authority and provides a cluster of battles in the culture wars uh, currently waged about the proper character of individual virtue, family structure, and communal commitments. The dominant culture is well focused on enabling individual self-realization uh, uh, and self-satisfaction. It is this consumerist manifesto, uh, broadly conceived, that at the end of the 1980s radically undermined the hopes of the communist manifesto. It abruptly brought to collapse Marxist regimes across Europe, for their citizens had become more concerned with the prospect of consumer satisfaction than the pursuit of Marxist socialist ideas. The same, though, can be said about the aspirations of mainline Christianity, most particularly in Western Europe and to varying extents in North America. In great measure, Western European and North American Christians have become much more engaged in the pursuit of self-realization and self-satisfaction than the embrace of a life of crucified love for God and fellow man. Rather than energies being directed in the pursuit of the kingdom of heaven, there's been a committed pursuit of imminent goods. The result has been the thoroughgoing dechristianization of culture and loss of faith, of which John Paul II speaks in Veritatis Splendor. In contrast, for traditional Christianity, all moral concerns are oriented to a point of ultimate reference. The ultimate truth is not a thing. It is a person. It is the Trinity. All human struggle and suffering is located within the struggle to holiness, the struggle to keep the first of the great commandments, to love God with all one's heart, so that one can not only love God, but also love one's neighbor with rightly directed love. This recognition of the centrality of the holy leads to relocating the pursuit of the good within the pursuit of holiness. Thus, all concerns with justice, including social justice, must be set within larger concerns for charity and for mercy. The enterprises of virtue become otherworldly in their focus, among other things. This turn from the good to the holy establishes boundaries, for example, against physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. Every act in this world is placed within the taken, care, taken for granted requirements of the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, from the apostles and the fathers. Christians have sought to live within the life of entering, life world of entering into the kingdom of God, recognizing that the fullness of their lives is achieved only in the liturgy and the mysterious life of the church. It is for this reason that in the Byzantine rites of the Orthodox Church, the priest begins all of the mysteries, and most particularly the liturgy, with the proclamation, Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
the priest is announcing, here is the privileged epistemic standpoint. Here's where it is. Not, you don't have to wait to die to get there. If you answer worthily, you made it when the priest makes that proclamation. That's why after the words of institution, you know, this is my body, this is my body, and before the epiclesis, which through which the holy things are transformed into the body and blood of Christ, the, the priest says, think of all the things we've, re, uh, we've seen. Uh, the grave, uh, the cross, the grave, the resurrection, the uh, ascension to heaven, the session at the right hand of God, of the Father, and the glorious and second coming. He speaks outside of time because if you've entered fully, you now have the privileged epistemic standpoint and your heart opens. It is within the, that kingdom that Christians come to know the full meaning of the human condition, and only there. It is out of that knowledge that they come to live in discord the society around them, so that as in the uh, second century epistle to Diogenetus, uh, they can agree with him, every country is their fatherland and every fatherland is a foreign country. It is not just that the whole gamut of con human concerns from sexuality, marriage and reproduction to suffering, dying and death are nested within expectations radically different from a culture that proceeds as if God did not exist and as if Christ were not the Messiah of Israel and the Son of the living God, and as if the world did not have a direction towards ultimate purpose to find in a cosmic history, reaching from creation through the fall to incarnation, redemption, the restoration of all things at the second coming, most significantly, Christians know that they possess this crucial knowledge by having come to claim it liturgically. It is a knowledge in terms of which all morality must be understood and in terms of which all social structures are to be evaluated. Christians know things about the deep reality framing the human condition, which knowledge they alone possess. I mean, only Christians know that the world is created, that there was a fall, and then an act more important than creation is incarnation. Incarnation overshadows an importance of creation. Uh, and then the, there will be the restoration of all things. It is not only that knowledge about right action and virtue must be situated within a deep knowledge of the meaning of the universe possessed uniquely by Christians, but also that Christians can place the significance of everything within points of ultimate purpose and meaning. Indeed, the traditional Christian commitments are radically otherworldly in locating all meaning in terms of goals or purposes that transcend the horizon of the finite and the imminent. Traditional Christians take outrageously seriously Christ's account of the two great commandments, recognizing that the first commandment is love God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and uh, uh, that it is not. Only, it is not only, it's only there that one can appreciate what it is to live not only your life, but to turn to others in rightly ordered love. Okay, you survive section two. Section three is the last long one, the, the, the four sections are when you get to go to sleep and I say really strange things. Section three is entitled, The Importance of Embedding All in a Life World Structured by Right Action, Right Worship, and Right belief. Any attempt by traditional Christians to renew the surrounding culture and rightly to direct education must begin from the high ground of recognizing that Christians possess knowledge crucial to everyone's life, as well as a mode of knowing integral to coming to terms with the human condition. As already stressed, it is only Christians who possess the fullness of knowledge crucial to understand the purpose and significance of human and cosmic history. Only we know it. Christians know that all history comes from the creation, develops through the fall, incarnation, redemption, and then leads to the second coming of Christ and the restoration of all things. Most importantly, Christians know, Christians know who Christ is. So remember, that's a question posed very pointedly by Christ recorded in Matthew. We know, which other people don't know, that he is the Messiah of Israel, the Son of the living God. They will recognize that the Christian life is the only secure road from pride and self-love to holiness and salvation. This theological knowledge should frame all other knowledge because it alone gives a full picture of the human condition. This knowledge of the, Christ of the Christians offers the privileged point of metaphysical and moral judgment from which all else must be judged and in terms of which all else is to be oriented. 
Christian know what things are really about. For this reason, a Christian university should place all of its knowledge within its theological knowledge. For without being placed in that perspective, all knowledge is radically one-sided, incomplete, misdirected, and misunderstood. Second, and most significantly, traditional Christians understand how to acquire that singular knowledge that brings the knower into intimate union with the known. It is important here to recall the traditional meaning of theology, a meaning summarized by Avagrius of Pontus, who died in the year 399. If you are a theologian, you will pray truly. And if you pray truly, then you're a theologian. This action recognizes that theological knowledge in its primary sense is noetic, that involves the union of the knower and the known. Such knowledge is not achieved through reflection or disclosed through analysis of the scriptures or even deductively achieved from drawing out the implications of basic premises, beliefs, and commitments of faith. Rather, such knowledge is achieved through a personal relation to an ultimate reality, the Trinity. This is a point I developed in earlier presentations here. The point is that right worship opens the heart to knowing rightly. The implication of this state of affairs are far more radical for Christian renewal and proper education than was appreciated, for example, by Henry Cardinal Newman. The no character of this knowledge has profound implications for rightly directed education and should be nested in a theology that is grounded in right worship. Rightly to understand the place of all human techniques, technologies, and sciences, as well as the appropriate character of basic human social structures such as the family, one must locate all of one's knowledge concerning these issues fully within the life world of traditional Christianity. Here only a brief and provocative account what else would you expect, uh, can be offered of the implications of this state of affairs. It will be done now by focusing on three concerns essential to the Christian life and to a properly directed renewal of culture and education. These concerns are at odds and endangered by the surrounding culture. The first two have that place because they are necessary conditions for worthily entering fully into liturgical worship, which is the epistemologically privileged standpoint in terms of which ultimate moral and metaphysical orientation can be achieved in only where it can be achieved. The Christian life, Christian renewal, and Christian education are centrally committed, therefore, to chastity and asceticism which are the conditions for entering properly and therefore successfully into Eucharistic right worship. This can only appear as an outrageous claim in a culture of hypersexuality, indulgence, and syncretism. Again, it depends on the traditional Christian appreciation that moral knowledge, true knowledge of human flourishing, and of the reality framing the human condition is achieved only through taking seriously the sixth diatitude. Again, it is the pure of heart who will see God. Absent a purity of heart achieved in right conduct and right worship, one will see wrongly. To appreciate rightly the content of morality, not to mention the focus of, the hum of human and cosmic history, one must act and worship rightly. Absent this rightly directed orientation, one will regard the universe as coming from nowhere, going to nowhere, and for no purpose and thus presume oneself to be at liberty to construct one's own narratives as one wishes, or one will affirm a narrative that will appreciate the universe in terms of wrongly construed final purposes and goals, subtly bringing one to aim one's life short of the mark. Why chastity? Well, first and foremost, if you've been in Texas, you know, at least with Texans, it's easy to observe that, observe that one of the major human passions is carnal sexuality. Carnal desire seeks forcefully to lay claim to our imagination, our imaginings, and our energies. It brings us to regard the body of the other not simply as an object, but an object of desire around which, for many, most of our lives are structured as spouses and parents. Sexual desire can both bind husbands and wives as well as radically shatter individuals, marriages, 
families, and society. In a hypersexualized culture in which not only sexually provocative images are omnipresent, but where there is an emphasis on self-determination, self-satisfaction, self-realization, sexual passions can quickly, easily, and powerfully aim persons away from a life that Christians recognize as essential to human flourishing. Characteristic of this circumstance is that people define themselves in terms of their sexual passions. They characterize their lifestyles in terms of the character of their sexual passions, those that they celebrate. In contrast, a proper cultivation and formation of persons and of culture must emphasize the task of bringing all sexual urges and expression within the bounds of the marriage of a man, husband and wife, and then in terms of an ascetic pursuit of holiness. Here it is worth noting how the church emphasizes that sexuality within marriage is fully chaste. One week after being brought into the mystery of marriage, one week after a couple is married, the Christian couple is then brought back in the Orthodox Church to the uncrowning service. It really takes place after they've gone on a honeymoon. They are married, no contract, it's done to them, it's a direct object. And then they come back, and then they're standing up in front of the congregation after religion. The priest announces, with double entendre to everyone, uh, uh, the priest announces to the Congress congregation before whom they standing that here is a couple that have come together in concord and have accomplished the compact of marriage. The priest then reminds the couple and the congregation that the law of marriage is a reward for chastity, for they are pure who are united in the marriage which thou hast made lawful. And they're crowned again as Adam and Eve. It is not just an all-sexual expression is placed within the marriage bed, whereas St. Paul in Hebrews reminds us the bed is undefiled, but that the couple's sexuality is integrated within the life of the church. The union of Adam and Eve, man and woman, becomes rightly ordered and properly directed in that context. In the context of the assembly of right-believing Christians, the couple will be taught about Christian sexual asceticism, maybe not before the uh, the honeymoon, but afterwards. On the one hand, carnal intercourse will uh, be understood as strengthening the tie of the husband and wife. And here I'm going to quote from the Council in Trullo in 692, affirming the marital intercourse of priests with their wives. Uh, I have to uh, disclose I have a conflict of interest here. Uh, my youngest daughter is the wife of a priest, and I hope I have many more grandchildren through her. It continues. As the Council put it, Continuing, however, in conformity with the ancient canon of apostolic rigorism, that is, what is required for everyone, you might be able to get away from excusing circumstances, and orderliness, we desire henceforth that the lawful marriage ties of sacred men become stronger, and we are no wise dissolving their intercourse with their wives, this goes back to Augustine. Remember, Augustine, the Fourth Council of Carthage in 417, passed a canon forbidding married men to have intercourse with their wives, uh, uh, or priests to have intercourse with their wives, or uh, married deacons had, in the canon to say, huh, have intercourse, it's good. Uh, so continuing, however, in conformity with the ancient canon of apostolic rigorism, acrevia, and orderliness, we desire that henceforth the lawful marriage ties of sacred men become stronger. And we are no wise dissolving their intercourse with their wives, not depriving them of their mutual relationship and companionship when properly maintained in due season. No mention about kids. Hey, it's all the unitive stuff. Yet on the other hand, Sexuality also becomes an element of the couple's ascetic struggle as companions in the pursuit of salvation through loving God, their spouse, and not themselves. The married couple's sexual asceticism, as for example, when they abstain from choral intercourse as a part of the Eucharistic fast, that is, uh, part of the Eucharistic fast requires at least not having intercourse the night before going to communion, binds them in an ascetic struggle common to all Christians, including celibate monastics. They are united in turning from self-love to an all-consuming love of God and rightly directed love of their neighbors. In a culture that not only accepts heterosexual fornication and serial monogamy, but is also moving towards accepting homosexual unions, the Christian insight into the purpose and direction of this powerful human passion is just not obscured, but brought to derision and condemnation. 
it is nearly incomprehensible within the secular culture that one should affirm an ascetic life leading to the example of virtual life of those who pursue God alone, the monks. A serious cultural renewal in a right direction of Christian education must aspire to filling monasteries with young men and women who through their prayer can bring God's uncreated energies to reform the world for only God reforms world. Without those whose chastity leads to monasticism, the world is in great jeopardy. As St. Uh, Silouan the Athenite, one of the greatest uh, uh, Orthodox theologians of the 20th century, who reposed in 13, uh, 1939, uh, never went to high school, uh, warns us, thanks to monks, prayer continues unceasing on earth, and the whole world profits. For through prayer, the world continues to exist. Uh, but when prayer fails, the world with, will perish. Behind this is the story of the Lama Dvav, uh, the 30 just men of Israel. As long as there are 30 men uh, praying with total devo devotion, God's just wrath will be held back. So each monk must pray as if he were number 30. Hey, better not stop, get in trouble. In a culture directed by the consumer manifesto to enjoy peaceably the fullest possession, a possibility of satisfaction of all one's urges, the Christian commitment to asceticism is generally obscure. Few live anymore in the apostolic rhythm of Wednesday and Friday fast as a means of redirecting their energies and sanctifying their lives. When asceticism is considered, it is often appreciated wrongly as a means of the accretion of merit rather than as a means to transform oneself through the discipline of the apostles, the fathers, and the church. Worse yet, asceticism comes to be appreciated in juridical terms. A rightly directed asceticism is core to the human struggle to aim one's life rightly. It is for this reason, for example, that the development of the practice of dispensing from fasts and other ascetic rules shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of asceticism. Asceticism is a discipline. It is a cure. It is a therapy. It is a therapy aimed at correcting our passions and curing our hearts so that we can be pure of heart and see God. Talk about it, dispensing from an ascetic discipline is something like talking about dispensing a diabetic from insulin. It only makes sense if a first therapeutic need is overridden by an even more important therapeutic intervention or goal requiring a different treatment. That is, asceticism must always be understood, not as an end in itself, but as a way of breaking willfulness and pride that is self-love, so as to become worthy and therefore able to enter into the Eucharist for the kingdom of heaven. Finally, central to the Christ truth of Christianity is the recognition that humans are creatures created by their nature to worship God. Outside of right worship, all human life is wrongly ordered. Chastity and asceticism are merely preludes to fully participating in right worship. Through true repentance, there is a rebirth of chastity confirmed in asceticism, which allows participation in Eucharistic worship. Rightly directed worship is provocative because it leads beyond the good to the holy. As, the, as a result, the focus is not on good works, but on repentance and faith where the faith must be secure enough to issue in good works, including chastity and asceticism. J, uh, James, the brother of God, uh, says, so faith in itself, if it has no works, is dead. The final goal is not the works, not the effects of a faith that, the, the, the final goal is not the works, but the effects of a faith that makes it possible for us to become holy, so that the presence of the uncreated energies of God can transform us. For this reason, Paul quotes Genesis in his letter to the Romans, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. It is a rightly directed worship in which the worshiper is moved to deep repentance and faith. that true human flourishing is achieved, a flourishing beyond goodness, justice, and rightly ordered works by being first and foremost anchored in the cleansing and restoring and renewing power of the holy, the uncreated energies of God. You've made it to the last page. Okay, It's called Christian Renewal in Post-Christian Culture, a brief hymnological conclusion. One page, please. The secular city, the city in which we are united in a thin vision of the common moral enterprise. 
while at the same time we are divided by contrasting thick visions of the good and human flourishing, is set over against the city of man as the community of sinful, uh, but still right-believing Christians who in broken and half-hearted repentance seek to be one with the assembly of the saints. Here a deep truth about Christian community in the world is disclosed, one that is brought to an epiphany in the Akathist hymn, which in the Greek usage is sung on the first five Fridays of Great Lent. On the surface, on these first Fridays, the church stands in gratitude for a miraculous deliverance of New Rome in AD 620. This hymn of Patriarch Sergius points to the synergy and symphony between the city of God, the heavenly assembly of the saints, and the city of those seeking finally to repent, to renew their hearts and their culture. The Stikos, following the Synaxarian, declares, I quote, the city in thanksgiving and watchfulness does praise her, Theotokos, praise her who upholdeth and constantly watches in wartime, giving the victory. This hymn, thanks to the Theotokos, describes her as the city of the king of all, for she carries him in her womb. In the fourth verse of the fifth O, but then describes the body of the Christians as the city, and asks the Theotokos to guard your city from all assaults of the enemy. She is the polis, she is the city. We are the city, we are the polis. The hymn interplays the assembly of the saints in heaven with the assembly of us sinners seeking to be saints here below. We are joined together, although the hymn and its origin gave thanks for a victory that secured the polis, the city of New Rome, for more than 800 years, it continues to be sung over half a millennium after the polis falls. It is sung for that city that is bound in right worship and right belief. As the Kentuckian repeats again and again, to thee, the champion leader, do I, your city, ascribe thank offerings of victory. It is here in the city of man as the assemblage of sinful humans, seeking to be in symphony with the assembly of the saints, that we must transform ourselves into the citizens of that heavenly city. It is here that right-ordered cultural renewal can occur. Thank you so very much for your attention. Now, undoubtedly, that has provoked questions. I presume you'll turn off the camera so if I'm provoked to say politically insensitive things on, I don't have to say them on camera. Questions? Can't be that silence. You can't have become the phasing. It's a, what it is, is an account of what I take to be uh, the epistemological view of Christianity uh, that was part of the first thousand years and continues in much of the Christianity, yes.